Hi, this is Kimberly. This is a synopsis and a critique of Chapter 15 of the book Letters from Christopher, Tragic Confessions of the Watts Family Murders by Sherilyn Cadle. This chapter is titled, Two Texts with Shanann's Friends. I want to recap this chapter for you, but honestly, for the longest time, I didn't know what I just read. In fact, I read it several times trying to make sense of where the author was going with this. My God, it got on my freaking nerves. I couldn't discern where it was going, but I'm persistent and I figured it out. What I found out was that the author cherry-picked some stuff from Discovery and randomized it. Now that took a while and a lot of investigation, but I now generally grasp what she did and how I can form a few impressions to share with you. This chapter starts out talking about the Saturday night before the murders. Chris and Nikki went out on their hot and heavy last day, leaving the children with a sitter. If you'll remember, Nikki was preparing for said date by exploring the interwebs for ways to prepare for anal sex and double penetration. I'm not judging. The heart wants what the heart wants. Shanann, of course, was in Arizona, and according to this chapter, one of her friends called to talk to the babysitter. Did that really happen? I was not aware of this. But if so, if she did do this, what a nosy biddy. Did Shanann know about and allow this? But yeah, I found this in the discovery. Quote, Cassie talked with the babysitter and learned that Chris was not home from the baseball game yet. End quote. That's very interesting. Did they go back to high school over the weekend in Arizona? The chapter starts, quote, on Saturday night in Arizona, as Shanann was with some of her friends and expressed her fear that Christopher was cheating on her, one of the friends called their house for Shanann and talked with the babysitter, and Christopher was not home from the baseball game yet, end quote. Oh my God, that was one long, confusing run-on sentence. But here we go with the unnamed friends. I'll label them for you. We have her friend, Shanann's friend, another friend, their friends, and one of them and one of the friends. So perhaps I was mistaking about them not having a name. Shanann and her unnamed friends on Saturday night all chose the topic of discussion to be Chris and Shanann's marriage. Her friends informed her that their opinions were that Chris was cheating on her. Shanann was highly suspicious of the $62 charge for dinner. And then this quote in the book, Quote, once back to her room, Shanann did talk with Christopher, but decided not to drill him about it, end quote. How does the author know this? How does she know what Shanann decided? It was a conversation no one was privy to except for Chris and Shanann. Now, if Christopher told you the conversation, then it needs to be indicated in the book. And there is this paragraph that makes no sense to me. I just haven't a clue. Quote, Shanann's friends told the FBI their gut told them Shanann and the girls were not alive because it was not possible given her pattern of life, end quote. What the hell is she talking about? I, of course, checked the discovery. I did a search for pattern, and voila, I found it. It's not friends, plural. It is friend, Cassie. It is a summary of her interview with police. This is a quote from the investigator's notes in Discovery, quote, Cassie told me that her gut tells her that Shanann and the girls are not alive because it is not possible given their pattern of life that she knows, end quote. Referring, of course, to the day that Shanann and the girls seemingly disappeared. Reading it in that context, it now makes sense. But reading a book shouldn't mean cross-referencing, unless I'm in school doing a damn paper or I'm writing a thesis. Upon further investigation, I found that the author for the entire chapter lifted straight from the CBI summary. She didn't even make it flow conversationally, which is why I became suspicious and checked. To illustrate my point, the chapter read, quote, Shanann's friend said that Shanann was not the type of person to be able to hold her emotions in. She said that Shanann did not say there was any mention of her and Christopher separating before she left for Arizona. They agreed to counseling while she was in Arizona, end quote. Discovery says, quote, 
Cassie said that Shanann is not the type of person to be able to hold her emotions in. Cassie said that Shanann did not say there was any mention of her and Chris separating before she left for Arizona. They agreed to counseling while she was in Arizona. This is what the entire chapter is. So if you do not have the book, please reference the document called Chris Watts Redacted Final, page 560 onward for Cassie's interview with the CBI. Why pay for something when you can find it on the internet? internet word for word free. So those that are ragging on me about give her a break, at least she tried, this is her first book, why didn't you write a book, blah blah blah. No, she didn't try. Any of us could have done this. This is lazy writing. Hell, it's not even writing. This would have received a zero if she were in school, even elementary school. It was her communication with Chris that was a golden opportunity, a rare chance to absolutely be successful with a very unique book. That should not be squandered, and I see it as wasted, thrown away, not seized. He probably won't talk with anyone else now. We need to get inside that peanut head and figure out how he was able to fool, it seems, everyone he was in contact with throughout his life, and then boom, explode. We need information on what the red flags were so as to warn others. Another confusing sentence in this chapter, quote, Her friend said that Christopher was a great guy, but there were no others to be concerned about regarding Shanann's disappearance, end quote. What? Maybe I'm just tired. Sometimes things will look different to me later, and I'll be like, oh, okay, I get it. But no, it's the next day, and I'm still baffled. But after looking up the word-for-word -word copy from Discovery, it makes sense when paired with the remaining part of an interview. And then we get these hard-to-read and understand texts between friend and Shanann. This is a place where a full-on copy text would have been desirable. Then she could have even given the friend a pseudonym if she didn't want to name them or not contact them for permission to use her name. Mrs. Cato says, quote, Below are screenshots her friend sent the FBI that are pertinent to this case, end quote. But they are not screenshots. And this is exactly page 561 of Discovery where texts were summarized for a report. My suggestion is, with something like this, to try and make a paragraph that's easy to read and understand the main point. I'm getting a headache again from trying to decipher this. I must be honest, the layout is lousy and hard to read in this book. The date format is hard on the eyes and it includes bullet points and long blocks of text that are not broken up with at least a sub-bullet point or a new paragraph. I feel like I needed to use a ruler as a place marker so I didn't skip lines reading this. Some parts are word for word and others are generalizations. To be fair, this is how it is for the report inside the discovery, but she did a full on duplication without cleaning it up. This whole chapter is a whole bunch of page filler and apathetic writing if you ask me. Again, she used the copy paste function for this entire chapter. I can understand doing that to get you started, but then make it flow better and easier to read, and then cross-check to make sure you've not destroyed any facts in the process. But the thing is, most don't want to read the discovery. They want someone to do it for them, and then present it in a tidier form, wrapped in pretty paper topped with a bow. I ran across this text from Shanann to Chris that Cadle included in the chapter. Quote, Please take five minutes today to tell me how you were feeling. I love you, Christopher, more than you know. End quote. I almost tripped and fell running to the discovery to compare this. No, no, no. This is how Shanann said it. Quote, Please take five minutes today to write me and tell me how you were feeling. I love you, Chris, more than you know. End quote. It's Chris, damn it. Don't misquote someone in a book. See, it's shit like this why I can't trust the author and have to keep checking up on her. In fact, when she's doing this weird thing with the text, she should stop alluding to him as Christopher when she makes reference to things Shanann supposedly said. And if you're going to quote someone, it has to be done with the exact spellings, shortening of words, all the nuances. Should I get a pen, mark it up with corrections, and send this book back to her? I still don't get why she calls him Christopher. 
in the two letters that she has included so far in the book, he signs off as Chris. It's fine if she wants to call him by his proper given name, but please don't say someone said Christopher when they didn't. Just because it's in the discovery doesn't mean you have to copy every last detail, such as, quote, there is a do not disturb while driving text from Shanann to friend, end quote. That is not vital to the case or the book or the chapter, but police have to document everything. This was extracted from their phones and transcribed for their report. The person doing this does not decide what is important or not. All you are doing is taking up space where something more vital could have been, such as correctly spelled words, punctuation, a new paragraph, etc. Summarizing means you can leave out insignificant stuff, but that means only if I can understand what your friggin' point is. There are bullet points several lines long, one that took up nearly an entire page. It's important to know that indentation can lead the eyes to the next line in writing. In a nutshell, yes, bullet points make for easy reading, but not if it's an entire page long with no break. The eyes need something to hold on to, to follow the text. Again, she was doing just exactly what was in the CBI report. No cleaning up. For instance, where it says in the chapter, I am nowhere near perfect, but I love unconditionally. I give my all. I do so much as a mom and wife, more than 90% of women out there. This fucking sucks so bad because I do love him and his fucking flaws, end quote. Friend encourages Shanann. At Friend encourages Shanann, start a new freaking paragraph or break. But no, it goes on and on and on. God Almighty, my eyes. Just because a new paragraph or line was not in the report does not mean that you should not clean it up for your book. And also, stop it already with the weird text thing, where it goes half quote, half generalization. Pick one or the other and stay with it, please. The title of this chapter does not make sense in my opinion. The whole damn chapter really pissed me off. It's a waste of paper. Just get the PDF of Discovery and search for Cassie. I didn't even realize this at first. It was only after doing a comparison. If you are going to go off the Discovery, and yes, I understand that for reasons of obtaining facts and dates that you would do so, I would have done that too had I chosen to take on a project of this magnitude. But these agents, detectives, and officers are not writing a book. They are doing a report of their findings. I'm not saying one should never refer to the discovery findings when writing a true crime book. Of course you would. But the difference is, Mrs. Cato was actually able to converse with this Nimrod. That's what I came to this book for. Remember last chapter, where Ronnie was bad-mouthing and calling Shanann names? Well, I found this little gem while I was matching the book to the discovery. A short retort from Shanann in one of the discovery reports. It says, quote, Shanann says she would not change a thing and calls herself a saint for not telling his mom that she is a narcissist stupid bitch, end quote. And that will be the end of this video. I will pick up with chapter 16 in the next video. Thank you for listening.